Not thinking of the proud world's pleasure, but cherishing your friendship's claim, I would have wished a finer treasure to pledge my token to your name, one worthy of your soul's perfection, the sacred dreams that fill your gaze, your verses limpid, live complexion, your noble thoughts and simple ways. But let it be. Take this collection of sundry chapters as my suit, half humorous, half pessimistic, blending the plain and idealistic, amusements yield the careless fruit of sleepless nights, light inspirations born of my green and withered years, the intellect's cold observations, the heart's reflections writ in tears. Chapter One to live he hurries, and to feel makes haste. Prince Vazimsky My uncle, man of firm convictions, by falling gravely ill, he's won a due respect for his afflictions, the only clever thing he's done. May his example profit others. But, God, what deadly boredom, brothers, to tend a sick man night and day, not daring once to steal away. And, oh, how base to pamper grossly and entertain the nearly dead, to fluff the pillows for his head and pass him medicines morosely, while thinking under every sigh, the devil takes you, uncle, die. Just so, a youthful rake reflected, as through the dust by post he flew, by mighty Zeus's will elected sole heir to all the kin he knew. Ludmilla's and Ruslan's adherents, without a foreword's interference, may I present, as we set sail, the hero of my current tale. Onegin, my good friend and brother, was born beside the neighbor's span, where maybe, reader, you began, or sparkled in one way or other. I, too, there used to saunter forth, but found it noxious in the north. An honest man, who'd served sincerely, his father ran up debts galore. He gave a ball some three times yearly, until he had no means for more. Fate watched Eugene in his dependence. At first, Madame was in attendance, and then Monsieur took on the child, a charming lad, though somewhat wild. Monsieur Labbé, a needy fellow to spare his charge excessive pain, kept lessons light and rather plain. His views on morals ever mellow, he seldom punished any lark, and walked the boy in Letney Park. But when the age of restless turnings became in time our young man's fate, the age of hopes and tender yearnings, Monsieur Labbé was shown the gate. And here's Onegin, liberated, to fad and fashion newly mated, a London dandy, hair all curled, at last he's ready for the world. In French he could and did acutely express himself and even write. In dancing, too, his step was light, and bows he had mastered absolutely. Who'd ask for more? The world could tell that he had wit and charm as well. We've all received an education in something, somehow, have we not? So thank the Lord that in this nation a little learning means a lot. Onegin was, so some decided, strict judges not to be derided, a learned, if pedantic sort. He did possess the happy thought of free and easy conversation, or in a grave dispute he'd wear the solemn expert's learned air and keep to silent meditation. And how the lady's eyes he lit with flashes of his sudden wit. The Latin vogue today is waning, and yet I'll say on his behalf he had sufficient Latin training to gloss a common epigraph, cite juvenile in conversation, put vale in a salutation, and he recalled, at least in part, a line or two of Virgil's art. He lacked, it's true, all predilection for rooting in the ancient dust of history's annals full of must, but knew by heart a fine collection of anecdotes of ages past, from Romulus to Tuesday last. Lacking the 
fervent dedication that sees in sounds life's highest quest, he never knew, to our frustration, a dactyl from an anapest. Theocritus and Homer bored him. But reading Adam Smith restored him, and economics he knew well, which is to say that he could tell the ways in which a state progresses, the actual things that make it thrive, and why for gold it need not strive when basic products it possesses, his father never understood, and mortgaged all the land he could. I have no leisure for retailing the sum of all our hero's parts, but where his genius proved unfailing, the thing he'd learned above all arts, what from his prime had been his pleasure, his only torment, toil and treasure, what occupied the livelong day, his languid spirit's fretful play, was love itself, the art of ardour, which Ovid sang in ages past and for which song he paid at last by ending his proud days a martyr in dim Moldavia's vacant waste, far from the Rome his heart embraced. How early on he could dissemble, conceal his hopes, play jealous swain, compel belief, or make her tremble, seem cast in gloom or mute with pain, appear so proud or so forbearing, at times attentive, then uncaring. What languor when his lips were sealed, what fiery art his speech revealed, what casual letters he would send her. He lived, he breathed one single dream. How self-oblivious he could seem, how keen his glance, how bold and tender, and when he wished, he'd make appear the quickly summoned glistening tear. How shrewdly he could be inventive and playfully astound the young, use flattery as warm incentive, or frighten with despairing tongue, and how he'd seize a moment's weakness to conquer youthful virtue's meekness through force of passion and of sense, and then await sweet recompense. At first he'd beg a declaration and listen for the heart's first beat, then stalk love faster and entreat a lover's secret assignation, and then in private he'd prepare in silence to instruct the fair. How early he could stir or worry the hearts of even skilled coquettes, and when he found it necessary to crush a rival, oh, what nets, what clever traps he'd set before him, and how his wicked tongue would gore him. But you, you men in wedded bliss, you stayed his friends despite all this. The crafty husband fawned and chuckled, Forbless disciple and his tool, as did the sceptical old fool and the majestic antlered cuckold, so pleased with all he had in life, himself, his dinner, and his wife. Some mornings still abed he drowses until his valet brings his tray. What? Invitations? Yes, three houses have asked him to a grand soiree. There'll be a ball, a children's party. Where will he dash to, my good hearty? Where will he make the night's first call? Oh, never mind. He'll make them all. But meanwhile, dressed for morning pleasure, bedecked in broad-brimmed Bolivar, he drives to Nevsky Boulevard to stroll about at total leisure until Breguet's unsleeping chime reminds him that it's dinner time. He calls a sleigh, as daylight's dimming, the cry resounds, Make way! Let's go! His collar, with its beaver trimming, is silver bright with frosted snow. He's off to Talons, late and racing, quite sure he'll find Caverin pacing. He enters, cork and bottle spout, the comet wine comes gushing out, a bloody roast beef's on the table, and Truffles, youth's delight so keen, the very flower of French cuisine, and Strasbourg pie, that deathless fable, while next to Limburg's lively mould sits ananas in splendid gold. Another round would hardly hurt them to wash those sizzling cutlets down, but now 
the chime and watch alert them. The brand new ballet's on in town. He's off. This critic most exacting of all that touches art or acting, this fickle swain of every star and honoured patron of the bar, to join the crowd, where each is ready to greet an entrechat with cheers or Cleopatra with his jeers to hiss at Phaedre, so unsteady, recall Moina and rejoice that everyone has heard his voice. Enchanted land! There, for a season, that friend of freedom ruled the scene, the daring satirist von Wiesin, as did derivative Knyazhnin. There, Ozerov received the nation's unbidden tears and its ovations, which young Semyonova did share, and our Katenin gave us there Corneille's full genius resurrected. And there, the caustic Shakovskoy refreshed the stage with comic joy. Didlot, his crown of fame perfected, there too, beneath the theatre's tent, my fleeting youthful days were spent. My goddesses, you vanished faces, oh, hearken to my woeful call. Have other maidens gained your places, yet not replaced you, after all? Shall once again I hear your chants, or see the Russian muse of dance perform her soaring soulful flight? Or shall my mournful gaze alight on unknown faces on the stages? And when across this world I pass a disenchanted opera glass, shall I grow bored with mirth and rages, and shall I then in silence yawn and recollect a time that's gone? The theatre's full, the boxes glitter, the restless gallery claps and roars, the stalls and pit are all a-jitter, the curtain rustles as it soars, and there, ethereal, resplendent, poised to the magic bow attendant, a throng of nymphs, her guardian band, Istomina takes up her stand. One foot upon the ground she places, and then the other slowly twirls. And now she leaps, and now she whirls, like down from Ale's lips she races, then spins and twists and stops to beat her rapid, dazzling, dancing feet. As all applaud, Onegin enters, and treads on toes to reach his seat. His double glass he calmly centers on ladies he has yet to meet. He takes a single glance to measure these clothes and faces with displeasure, then, trading bows on every side with men he knew or friends he spied, he turned at last and vaguely fluttered his eyes toward the stage and play, then yawned and turned his head away. "'It's time for something new,' he muttered. "'I've suffered ballets long enough, but now did lock is boring stuff. While all those cupids, devils, serpents upon the stage still romp and roar, and while the weary band of servants still sleeps on furs at carriage door, and while the people still are tapping, still sniffling, coughing, hissing, clapping, and while the lamps both in and out still glitter grandly all about, and while the horses, bored at tether, still fidget, freezing in the snow, and coachmen by the fires glow, curse masters and beat palms together, Onegin now has left the scene, and driven home to change and preen. Shall I abandon every scruple and picture truly with my pen the room where fashion's model pupil is dressed, undressed, and dressed again? Whatever clever London offers to those with lavish whims and coffers, and ships to us by Baltic seas in trade for tallow and for trees, Whatever Paris, seeking treasure, devises to attract the sight, or manufactures for delight, for luxury, for modish pleasure, all this adorned his dressing-room, our sage of eighteen summers' bloom. Imported pipes of Turkish amber, fine china, bronzes, all displayed, and purely the delight and pamper perfumes in crystal jars arrayed. Steel files and combs in many guises, straight scissors, curved ones, thirty sizes of brushes for the modern male, for hair and teeth and fingernail. Rousseau, 
permit me this digression, could not conceive how solemn Grimm dared clean his nails in front of him, the brilliant madcap of confession. In this case, though, one has to say that freedom's champion went astray. For one may be a man of reason and mind the beauty of his nails. Why argue vainly with the season? For custom's rule, a man prevails. Now, my Eugene, Chadayev's double, from jealous critics fearing trouble, was quite the pedant in his dress, and what we called a fop, no less. At least three hours he peruses his figure in the looking-glass, then through his dressing-room he'll pass like flighty Venus when she chooses in man's attire to pay a call at masquerade or midnight ball. Your interest peaked and doubtless growing in current fashions of toilette, I might describe in terms more knowing his clothing for the learned set. This might well seem an indiscretion. Description, though, is my profession. But pantaloons, gilet, and frock, these words are hardly Russian stock. And I confess in public sorrow that, as it is, my diction groans with far too many foreign loans. But if indeed I overborrow, I have of old relied upon our academic lexicon. But let's abandon idle chatter and hasten rather to forestall our hero's headlong dashing clatter in hired coach towards the ball. Before the fronts of darkened houses, along a street that gently drowses, the double carriage lamps in rows pour forth their warm and cheerful glows, and on the snow make rainbows glitter. One splendid house is all alight, its countless lampions burning bright, while past its glassed-in windows flitter in quick succession silhouettes of ladies and their modish pets. But look! On Egin's at the gateway. He's past the porter, up the stair, through marble entry rushes straightway, then runs his fingers through his hair and steps inside. The crush increases. The droning music never ceases. A bold mazurka grips the crowd. The press intense, the hubbub loud. The guardsman clinks his spurs and dances. The charming ladies twirl their feet, enchanting creatures that entreat a hot pursuit of flaming glances, while, muffled by the violin, the wives their jealous gossip spin. In days of dreams and dissipations, on balls I madly used to dote. No surer place for declarations or for the passing of a note. And so I offer, worthy spouses, my services to save your houses. I pray you, heed my sound advice. You too, you mummers, I commend you to keep your daughters well in sight. Don't lower your lorgnettes at night, or else, or else may God defend you. All this I now can let you know, since I dropped sinning long ago. So much of life have I neglected in following where pleasure calls. Yet were not morals ill-affected, I even now would worship balls. I love youth's wanton, fevered madness, the crush, the glitter, and the gladness, the ladies' gowns so well designed. I love their feet, although you'll find that all of Russia scarcely numbers three pairs of shapely feet. And yet, how long it took me to forget two special feet. And in my slumbers they still assail a soul grown cold, and on my heart retain their hold. In what grim desert, madman banished, will you at last cut memory's thread? Ah, oh, dearest feet, where have you vanished? What vernal flowers do you tread? Brought up in oriental splendor, you left no prints, no pressings tender upon our mournful northern snow. You loved instead to come and go on yielding rugs in rich profusion, while I, so long ago, it seems, for your sake smothered all my dreams of glory, country, proud seclusion. All gone are youth's bright years of grace, as from the meadow your light trace. Diana's breast is charming, brothers, and Flora's cheek, I quite agree, 
but I prefer above these others the foot of sweet terpsichore. It hints to probing ardent glances of rich rewards and peerless trances. Its token beauty stokes the fires, the willful swarm of hot desires. My dear Elvina, I adore it, beneath the table barely seen, in springtime on the meadows green, in winter with the hearth before it, upon the ballroom's mirrored floor, or perched on granite by the shore. I recollect the ocean rumbling. Oh, how I envied then the waves, those rushing tides in tumult tumbling, to fall about her feet like slaves. I longed to join the waves in pressing upon those feet, these lips caressing. No, never midst the fiercest blaze of wildest youth's most fervent days was I so racked with yearning's anguish. No maiden's lips were equal bliss, no rosy cheek that I might kiss, or sultry breast on which to languish. No, never once did passion's flood so rend my soul, so flame my blood. Another memory finds me ready, in cherished dreams I sometimes stand, and hold the lucky stirrup steady, then feel her foot within my hand. Once more imagination surges, once more that touch ignites and urges the blood within this withered heart, once more the love, once more the dart. But stop, enough. My babbling lyre has overpraised these haughty things. They're hardly worth the songs one sings, or all the passions they inspire. Their charming words and glances sweet are quite as faithless as their feet. But what of my Eugene? Half drowsing, he drives to bed from last night's ball, while Petersburg, already rousing, answers the drumbeat's duty call. The merchant's up, the peddler scurries, with jug in hand the milkmaid hurries, crackling the freshly fallen snow, the cabby plods to Hackney Row, in pleasant hubbub morns are waking, the shutters open, smoke ascends in pale blue shafts from chimney ends, the German baker's up and baking, and more than once in cotton cap has opened up his window trap. But, wearied by the ballroom's clamour, he sleeps in blissful, sheer delight, this child of comfort and of glamour, who turns each morning into night. By afternoon he'll finally waken, the day ahead all planned and taken, the endless round, the varied game, tomorrow too will be the same. But was he happy in the flower, the very springtime of his days, amid his pleasures and their blaze, amid his conquests of the hour, or was he profligate and hale amid his feasts to no avail? Yes, soon he lost all warmth of feeling. The social buzz became a bore, and all those beauties, once appealing, were objects of his thought no more. Inconstancy grew too fatiguing, and friends and friendship less intriguing, for after all, he couldn't drain an endless bottle of champagne to help those pies and beefsteaks settle, or go on dropping words of wit with throbbing head about to split. And so, for all his fiery metal, he did at last give up his love of pistol, sword, and ready glove. We still, alas, cannot forestall it. This dreadful ailment's heavy toll, the spleen is what the English call it. We call it simply Russian soul. T'was this our hero had contracted. And though, thank God, he never acted to put a bullet through his head, his former love of life was dead. Like Byron's Harold, lost in trances, through drawing rooms he'd pass and stare, but neither whist nor gossip there, nor wanton sighs, nor tender glances. No, nothing touched his sombre heart. He noticed nothing, took no part. Capricious bells of lofty station, you were the first that he forswore. For nowadays, in our great nation, the manner grand can only bore. I wouldn't say that ladies never discuss a say or bentham, ever, 
But generally, you'll have to grant that talk's absurd if harmless can't. On top of which, they're so unerring, so dignified, so awfully smart, so pious and so chaste of heart, so circumspect, so strict in bearing, so inaccessibly serene, mere sight of them brings on the spleen. You too, young mistresses of leisure, who late at night are whisked away in racing drushkies bound for pleasure along the Petersburg chaussee, he dropped you too in sudden fashion. Apostate from the storms of passion, he locked himself within his den, and, with a yawn, took up his pen and tried to write. But art's exaction of steady labour made him ill, and nothing issued from his quill. So thus he failed to join the faction of writers, whom I won't condemn, since, after all, I'm one of them. Once more an idler, now he smothers the emptiness that plagues his soul by making his the thoughts of others. A laudable and worthy goal, he crammed his bookshelf, overflowing, then read and read, frustration growing. Some raved or lied, and some were dense, some lacked all conscience, some all sense, each with a different dogma girded. The old was dated through and through, while nothing new was in the new. So books, like women, he deserted. And over all that dusty crowd, he draped a linen mourning shroud. I, too, had parted with convention, with vain pursuit of worldly ends, and when Eugene drew my attention, I liked his ways, and we made friends. I liked his natural bent for dreaming, his strangeness that was more than seeming, the cold, sharp mind that he possessed. I was embittered, he depressed. With passion's game, we both were sated. The fire in both our hearts was pale. Our lives were weary, flat, and stale, and for us both ahead there waited, while life was still but in its morn, blind fortune's malice and men's scorn. He who has lived as thinking being within his soul must hold men small. He who can feel is always fleeing the ghost of days beyond recall. For him, enchantment's deep infection is gone. The snake of recollection and grim repentance gnaws his heart. All this, of course, can help impart great charm to private conversation, and though the language of my friend at first disturbed me, in the end I liked his caustic disputation, his blend of banter and of bile, his sombre wit and biting style. How often in the summer quarter, when midnight sky is limpid light above the neighbor's placid water, the river gay and sparkling bright, yet in its mirror not reflecting Diana's visage, recollecting the loves and intrigues of the past, alive once more and free at last, we drank in silent contemplation the balmy fragrance of the night. Like convicts sent in dreaming flight to forest green and liberation, so we, in fancy then were born, back to our springtime's golden morn. Filled with his heart's regrets, and leaning against the rampart's granite shelf, Eugene stood lost in pensive dreaming, as once some poet drew himself. The night grew still, with silence falling, only the sound of sentries calling, or suddenly, from Million Street, some distant droshkis rumbling beat, or floating on the drowsy river, a lonely boat would sail along, while far away some rousing song or plaintive horn would make us shiver. But sweeter still, amid such nights, are Tasso's octave's soaring flights. Oh, Adriatic, grand creation, oh, Brenta, I shall yet rejoice when, filled once more with inspiration, I hear at last your magic voice. It's sacred to Apollo's choir. Through Albion's great and haughty lyre, it speaks to me in words I know. 
On soft Italian nights I'll go in search of pleasure's sweet profusion. A fair Venetian at my side, now chatting, now a silent guide. I'll float in gondola's seclusion. And she, my willing lips, will teach both love's and Petrarch's ardent speech. Will freedom come and cut my tether? It's time, it's time, I bid her hail. I roam the shore, await fair weather, and beckon to each passing sail. Oh, when, my soul, with waves contesting and caped in storms, shall I go questing upon the crossroads of the sea? It's time to quit this dreary lee and land of harsh, forbidding places, and there, where southern waves break high beneath my Africa's warm sky, to sigh for sombre Russia's spaces, where first I loved, where first I wept, and where my buried heart is kept. Eugene and I had both decided to make the foreign tour we'd planned, but all too soon our paths divided, for fate took matters into hand. His father died, quite unexpected, and round Eugene there soon collected the greedy horde demanding pay. Each to his own, or so they say, Eugene, detesting litigation and quite contented with his fate, released to them the whole estate with no great sense of deprivation. Perhaps he also dimly knew his aged uncle's time was due. And sure enough, a note came flying. The bailiff wrote as if on cue. Onegin's uncle, sick and dying, would like to bid his heir adieu. He gave the message one quick reading, and then by post Eugene was speeding, already bored, to uncle's bed, while thoughts of money filled his head. He was prepared, like any craven, to sigh, deceive, and play his part, with which my novel took its start. But when he reached his uncle's haven, a laid-out corpse was what he found, prepared as tribute for the ground. He found the manor fairly bustling with those who'd known the now deceased. Both friends and foes had come a-hustling, true lovers of a funeral feast. They laid to rest the dear departed, then, wined and dined and heavy-hearted, but pleased to have their duty done, the priests and guests left one by one. And here's Onegin, lord and master of woods and mills and streams and lands, a country squire. There he stands, that former wastrel and disaster. And rather glad he was, it's true, that he'd found something else to do. For two full days he was enchanted by lonely fields and burbling brook, by sylvan shade that lay implanted within a cool and leafy nook. But by the third he couldn't stick it. The grove, the hill, the field, the thicket quite ceased to tempt him any more, and presently induced a snore. And then he saw that country byways, with no great palaces, no streets, no cards, no balls, no poets' feats, were just as dull as city highways, and spleen, he saw, would dog his life like shadow or a faithful wife. But I was born for peaceful roaming, for country calm and lack of strife. My lyre sings, and in the gloaming my fertile fancies spring to life. I give myself to harmless pleasures, and far niente rules my leisures. Each morning early I'm awake to wander by the lonely lake or seek some other sweet employment. I read a little, often sleep. For fleeting fame I do not weep. And was it not in past enjoyment of shaded idle times like this I spent my days of deepest bliss? The country, love, green fields and flowers, sweet idleness, you have my heart. With what delight I praise those hours that set Eugene and me apart. For otherwise some mocking reader, or oh, God forbid, some wretched breeder of twisted slanders, might combine my hero's features here with mine, and then maintain the shameless fiction that, like proud Byron, I have penned a mere self-portrait in the end, as if today 
through some restriction, we're now no longer fit to write on any theme but our own plight. All poets I need hardly mention have drawn from love abundant themes. I too have gazed in rapt attention when cherished beings filled my dreams. My soul preserved their secret features. The muse then made them living creatures. Just so, in carefree song, I paid my tribute to the mountain maid and sang the Salgia captives' praises. And now, my friends, I hear once more that question you have put before. For whom these sighs your lyre raises? To whom, amid the jealous throng, do you today devote your song? Whose gaze, evoking inspiration, rewards you with a soft caress? Whose form, in pensive adoration, do you now clothe in sacred dress? Why no one, friends, as God's my witness? For I have known too well the witless and maddened pangs of love's refrain. Oh, blessed is he who joins his pain to fevered rhyme, for thus he doubles the sacred ecstasy of art. Like Petrarch, then, he calms the heart, subduing passion's host of troubles, and captures worldly fame to boot. But I, in love, was dense and mute. The muse appeared as love was ending, and cleared the darkened mind she found. Once free, I seek again the blending of feeling, thought, and magic sound. I write and want no more embraces. My straying pen no longer traces beneath a verse left incomplete the shapes of ladies' heads and feet. Extinguished ashes won't rekindle, and though I grieve, I weep no more. And soon, quite soon, the tempest's core within my soul will fade and dwindle. And then I'll write this world a song that's five and twenty cantos long. I've drawn a plan and know what's needed. The hero's named, the plotting's done, and meantime, I've just now completed my present novel's chapter one. I've looked it over most severely. It has its contradictions, clearly, but I've no wish to change a line. I'll grant the censor's right to shine and send these fruits of inspiration to feed the critic's hungry pen, Fly to the neighbor's water, then, my spirit's own newborn creation, and earn me tribute paid to fame, distorted readings, noise, and blame. <laughs>